All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is Miami Heat week, but we have a temporary ceasefire because today is your Know Your Foe segment because tomorrow is the big game. We are less than 24 hours away from taking over Doak South, and we have Mr. Alex Dono of the Locked On Canes podcast and also of 790 The Ticket. If you're a South Florida fan, you know exactly what that means. And Dave, let's get riding. You are Locked On Seminoles, your daily podcast on the Florida State Seminoles, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome back to another edition of Locked On Seminoles. What's up, everybody? It's your boy Drake here, and today in the stream yard, not only we have Mr. David Wise and his beautiful, beautiful face, I have the beard himself, Mr. Alex Dono of the Locked On Canes podcast. Alex, que pasa, mi amigo? I'm doing great, but I love how you mentioned ceasefire, and then three seconds later, you you throw in Doak South as if that's not going to get to get me a little riled up. But listen, you obviously Florida State travels very well down to South Florida, huge alumni base down in my area. So I, I'm just hoping that enough Hurricanes fans are motivated to show up to Hard Rock Stadium this weekend, man. So at least uh, I've, I've seen some fights in the parking lot. I've seen fights in the stands over the years. Let's just hope we keep it friendly out there. Yeah, let's keep it friendly. And folks, today's episode is brought to you by Underdog. Sign up on underdogfantasy.com with the promo code locked on L O C K E D O N and get your first deposit dep- doubled up to $100. Alex, thank you for stopping by. The first thing we have to ask Mario Cristobal is hired right after the whole Man Diaz debacle. Is he getting fired? Is he not? If he's still recruiting out there, do you get the phone call while he's in the recruit's house? What was the fanfare, you know, bringing in Mario and then basically how is it kind of devolved now? How does Miami feel about Super Mario down in Coral Gables? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't even just uh, bringing in Mario. I, I think that there there was a lot of rejoicing among the fan base to also change athletic directors because Blake James, the previous AD, was a bit of a train wreck. And, you know, there was not a whole lot of ambition with the athletic department. So getting Dan Radakovich to come in from Clemson to be the AD, which actually happened after the Cristobal hire, the order of it was a little bit strange. I'm not going to lie how that went down. Uh, but yeah, I think the majority of Miami fans had basically checked out on Manny Diaz by the time he was let go. It was a little bit messy the way that they handled it. But um, I, I think that the way that it went down, fellas, was Miami's board of trustees. They knew Cristobal was the guy they wanted and they knew he was on a certain timetable, you know, getting prepared for the Pac-12 championship game. And he didn't want to leave Oregon high and dry until after the Pac-12 title game, you know, heading into a bowl game. So they kind of had to wait for him. Um, I, I will say it's a little bit ironic when people feel bad for Manny Diaz because it's the same Manny Diaz who took the head coaching job at Temple and yeah. then two weeks later yeah. told Temple, yeah. see you later, I'm heading down to Miami. So it's like what goes around comes around. Uh, but yeah, there, there was plenty of rejoicing when Cristobal was hired. And what happened in South Florida was the expectations just went through the roof, right? A lot of people thinking, well, look, it's not just Mario. It's the athletic department. Alonso Highsmith is now the GM of football operations. You got the most expensive assistant coaching staff ever. Like this team is going to be a 10 or 11 game winner. Immediately, a lot of people thought. And coming off the year Tyler Van Dyke just had. So there was plenty of shock, right? When Miami lost to Middle Tennessee and North Carolina and Texas A&M, didn't realize at the time how bad Texas A&M was, which is a whole nother story. So, yeah, listen, certain folks out there are wondering, like, hey, are we really getting what we paid for? But I think that that's it, it's a little crazy to think like that when you're talking about, you know, five, six, seven games into a new coaching regime, because you see the way recruiting is going. It's going very well right now for Miami. And uh, I don't think Cristobal's lost the locker room or anything like that. So I, I think that we're just coming to find out there's maybe more growing pains with this thing than initially expected. Yeah, and and look, I'm going to keep the ceasefire in place here, but I am going to say some things that may be controversial to the Miami fan base. Wow, so you touched on, uh, yeah, TVD. Uh, Mario Cristobal came in with his quarterback. Um, I I think, not me included, a lot of people around the country thought that Tyler Van Dyke was quickly developing into, if not already, a fairly elite quarterback. Um, And it feels like he's been ruin um 
tell me what is going on. How did Tyler Van Dyke get from what he was to this? And how is it that the offense, which was expected to, I think, be one of the better units in the country, how is it that it struggled so much? Well, it's been a winding and bumpy road. Um, Tyler Van Dyke looked to be getting back to his old self before he suffered that injury against Duke. Uh, The first handful of games, um, everything was out of sync. And part of it was Tyler, right? Maybe he wasn't adapting to the new coaching as well as they thought he would or he thought he would. Because you notice that after it was in the Middle Tennessee game where he was just a disaster for every single player on the field, except for, I think, uh, Keyshawn Smith, one of the wide receivers, had a good game. Everybody else was terrible that game. You know, Tyler got benched in that game. And then after that one, you know, he and and Josh Gaddis, the new offensive coordinator, who's not very popular down here right now, fellas, uh, and Frank Ponce, the quarterback's coach, they started to hold extra sessions together. And they they kind of figured out how can we implement some of the things that the previous offensive coordinator, Rhett Lashley, was doing and make Tyler a little bit more comfortable. And then he he played very well uh, against North Carolina after that and, you know, was doing well against Duke before he got injured. So it looked like he was kind of, and and he had a good start in the Virginia tech game before all the penalties and stuff. So it looked like he was getting back to his old self. Then he gets hurt against Duke uh, and Jake Garcia has been a disaster, which we can get into that one as well. But as far as Tyler goes, um, another part of it is, and I know I'm going to sound like I'm making excuses, but Miami's wide receiver core decimated by injury early in the season. The offensive line has been decimated by injury. Tyler didn't look like himself. The coaching wasn't adapting to him. He wasn't adapting to the coaching. So um, I think it goes back to, first of all, maybe we overrated Tyler a little bit coming out of last year because we thought this is just all so easy for him that there's never going to be any adversity for this guy. He hit some adversity. Uh, but I think he's come a long way to recovering from that. And, and guys, like when I look at this matchup against Florida State, it's hard for me to envision – any path to victory for Miami that doesn't involve Tyler Van Dyke starting. And he's questionable at best for this game. And even if he does start, it's obviously still a very difficult game. Florida State's the better team right now on paper. There's no question about it. Um, But if it's not Tyler Van Dyke this weekend, everything else really has to be perfect unless Jake Garcia just shows up to a rivalry game. Like, guys, whatever you saw me do last week against Virginia, that wasn't really me. I'm just going to be throwing 60-yard dimes down the field. If it's not Tyler this weekend, it's going to be really, really hard for Miami to get a dub. So actually, I was just about to ask, ask about that. I know TVD right now is currently TBD. Insert joke here. But overall, I mean, we had David. You have David Lee discussing that he has looked better in practice. Like, do you fully expect him to play? And if not, I know Jake Garcia has been struggling. Is there any chance we might see actually Jacuri Brown, the true freshman, because we have seen Florida State struggle with basically that sort of somewhat dual threat as quarterback? So I kind of want to see like if it's not TVD, if he does play, is Jacuri Brown an actual viable option for his Miami offense? Uh, first, with Tyler, um, I think it's more than 50% that it's Jake starting. Um, I know Tyler apparently has been back in practice for the last few days, and, and he's seems to seem like he's recovering quicker uh, than, than expected. However, Mario Cristobal is not a reliable source of injury information, right? He, he tends to overplay how players are doing coming off of injuries, right? There have been times when he's teased us, you know, with people like Henry Parrish and Ja'Kai Clark and Zion Nelson in the past made it seem like, yeah, they're coming back this week and they don't. So I don't know. I, you know, I, I, maybe for a game like this, they might push Tyler and he might push himself a little bit harder to play this week. But, um, and so I think there is a chance he plays. I think it's, I have been saying all week, 55% Garcia, 45% Van Dyke. As far as Jakari Brown goes, Um, I can't envision him starting, but I think no matter who the starting quarterback is, he's going to get some reps because he gives Miami's offense a little bit of variety. Uh, He's he's been dangerous running the football in short yardage. Um, I don't feel like the coaches trust him to throw the football, and that's why I don't believe they're going to start him. Uh, I think he's going to be a guy where – you know, he's your short yardage wildcat option. And there's the threat since he is a quarterback. Maybe he'll throw the ball. He probably won't. So I, I think Jakari Brown's going to play the same role. No matter who the starting quarterback is, he's going to get a handful of snaps and, you know, hopefully do some dynamic things out there as he's been doing the last few weeks. Yeah. And speaking of variety, Drake, our audience needs a little variety in their lives. And I think you can help them with that, can't you? Well, mainly as a tall sponsor can help out with that. With our friends over at Underdog Fantasy, folks. Underdog Fantasy is basically one of the better things to basically spice up the college football season because it's the easiest place to play all your favorite teams, picks, whenever you want to. 
Me personally, I'm going with Duke quarterback Ryan Leonard mainly because Boston College isn't very good. So 50, over 50 and a half rushing yards is a great pick. And then also you have Drake May going up against Virginia, who sneakily has a very good pass defense. You can ask Alex Donald here. So go lower than 302. But folks, hit, hit, use promo code Locked On. That's L O C K E D O N, and Underdog will get will double your first deposit up to $100. Deposit 100 and get 100 back for the free. Go to underdogfantasy.com or find the Underdog Fantasy app in the App Store or Google Play Store. By the way, that's Underdog Fantasy. Promo code Locked On L O C K E D O N. Get in on the college football pick 'em action today. Now, Alex, you can probably imagine that a lot of our fan base just thinks Miami sucks at everything. A lot of people that don't follow closely look at the record, and that's their assumption. I, I want to hear from you. What is it that this Miami team, notwithstanding the record, does well? Um, the defensive front has been been coming on like an avalanche. Uh, they've been getting better throughout the year. Leonard Taylor is, is the top guy. Uh, I'm not spilling so any good. trade secrets here i know i know the florida state coaches are, are preparing for him number 56 uh defensive tackle he's been a monster and and one thing that miami does very well is produce tackles for a loss in negative plays they actually average seven and a half tfl per game uh taylor is coming off his best career game as a miami hurricane he had for TFL, a sack and a half last week against Virginia. I recognize Florida State is better than Virginia, so I'm not necessarily thinking he's going to do the exact same things this week as he did last week. Um, you know, Akeem Mesidor, his his health has been a little bit in question. Uh, I think he's going to play the transfer defensive end out of West Virginia. He's been one of the better pass rushers in the country statistically this year. He could pet potentially give Florida State some problems. And I, I think Miami's going to be tested there because um, they, they've they done a lot better against pocket passers than they have against mobile quarterbacks. So I think going up against Jordan Travis, trying to keep him contained is going to be a big time challenge. And uh, I just, I love the matchup fellas between Miami's rushing defense and Florida state's rushing offense. And I'm sure the Seminoles are feeling pretty confident about that. Given up, given that, you know, a few weeks back, uh, they went up against the top rushing defense in the conference against Clemson and they had uh, I think 206 yards on the ground in that game Miami's got the second best rushing defense in the conference so uh, they're, they're, they're going to try to keep Florida State's ground attack in check so I, I think that's that's probably what Miami does best and then I'll add in kind of a bonus here and this this is more of a factor if Van Dyke plays less of a factor if he doesn't but the Hurricanes receiving core is as healthy as they've been all season right I mentioned they were decimated by injury early on uh, Xavier Restrepo, who was their best receiver before he got injured in September, uh, I think he's going to be basically back to full strength uh, this week without a snap count. Uh, within the last month, Colby Young, who's you know he's got a lot of length and size, uh, he's not quite Johnny Wilson, but he's six foot five. He's got a long wingspan, very good with contested balls. He's been coming on lately. Uh, Jacoby George, who's probably the shiftiest receiver Miami has, has been you know, getting back healthy the last couple of weeks. So, you know, if whoever is is the quarterback can find some open receivers, Miami does have some playmakers there. I'm actually glad you do bring out the wide receiver because that's kind of one of the things I kind of want to – it's because I know it hasn't been a strength for you guys all season long, but one of the deficiencies with this Florida State defense is the lack of, I guess, consistent and aggressive uh, defensive back play. Now, you bring back XR7, XR Restrepo, some kid that I follow a lot, you know, through high school for recruiting purposes. Colby Young has also come on. One name I haven't heard mentioned a lot actually on here or in throughout the week is Will Mallory, someone who's been a veteran presence actually with the team overall. What exactly does this Miami offense need to do overall to basically have somewhat of a chance against a very talented and very solid and very consistent FSU defense? Yeah, especially FSU's pass defense. Uh, that, that's the one. And, and that's it's an interesting matchup if Van Dyke plays uh, because obviously like FSU's pass defense looks a lot better than their run defense, but Miami's not going to be able to run if they can't throw. Uh, so, you know, because you, you need to set that up and keep the defense honest a little bit. I'm glad you brought up Will Mallory uh, because he, you know, his his issue has always just been consistency. Um, but when he's on, he he's on and he is another big target. Uh, he's faster than he looks and he's six foot five. Uh, so this is it's one of the puzzling things why Miami hasn't been better in the red zone and they've been better in recent week. I mean, last week, you know, notwithstanding no touchdown scored, but they've been better overall the last few weeks in the in the red zone. A lot of that's because of Colby Young. But when you've got, you know, six foot five Colby Young, six foot five Will Mallory, six foot five Jaleel Skinner, who's, you know, a, a true freshman tight end who's made some plays. 
they should be able to to just you know to get more catches in the end zone than they have so that's definitely something to watch out for as well okay now I want to know what gives you there's obviously many things you've discussed that give you some concern about this game but I want to know what gives you the most pause because obviously you have the choice of well we're not sure what's going to happen at quarterback you have questions on the defense playing against a quarterback like Jordan Travis but what in this game gives you the most pause matchup wise yeah, it, it's it's a lot of things, a, a few things on on defense. I mean, I, I could have started with the offense because Miami's more deficiencies there, but I'll, I'll start with the defense because, you know, again, um, keeping mobile quarterbacks contained is a big one. And I think something that comes along with that is just giving up big, devastating passing plays. And so I, I look at, you know, and obviously Johnny Wilson being six foot seven, he's a matchup nightmare for anybody. And I think Tyreek Stevenson is going to get a lot of work on him, who's a pretty tall corner, but he's like six one, six foot two range going up against six foot seven is not an easy matchup. So I think I, I think that's definitely a big one uh, to look at. Um, so that gives me some pause. And Miami needs to run the football. And, you know, I know that that's something that, um, you know, Looked like it was coming on a little bit last week against Virginia. Henry Parrish uh, became the first 100-yard rusher since he did it back in September 10th. So Miami had, you know, like a month and a half, almost a two-month drought of, of any running back producing 100 yards. And then can can the Hurricanes kind of reintegrate uh, Jalen Knighton, who's been, I think, kind of in Cristobal's doghouse because he's just fumbles left and right. He had three lost fumbles in a four game span, which was not very good for him, but you know, he's obviously gave a lot of teams problems last season running the football. So will Miami be able to establish a running game, which is extra important if Jake Garcia is the starting quarterback, because if, you know, if, if Florida state stacks the box and Miami can't run and they make Garcia beat them with his arm or try to beat them with his arm, I think it could be a very long day because Miami was able to kind of play the field position last week and it ended up working four overtimes later against Virginia, but you're not going to be able to punt and kick your way to victory in this game. I don't think. And then I guess before we go over to brick, kind of basically go nuts and balls predictions wise, your offensive line has not, has not been offensive. I think we reserved that for like the Virginias and Boston College, which has been set, setting back football to pre-World War One era. Your offensive line has been dinged up with injuries. I think what Zion Nelson, I think, is out for this game. You have several like you know interchangeable linemen on the interior at center positions. Tell me if this off how this offensive line will fare up against a Fabian Love at, at Dennis Briggs or even a Jared oh, yeah. Burst as well, too. Yeah, and it and it's of course it seems like Florida State's defensive line is as healthy as they've been all season, which is not very good timing on Miami's point of view. Um, I, I think a big key here is going to be uh, true freshman Inez Cooper, who's been getting a lot of work at right guard. Uh, obviously, being a true freshman, he's a little bit raw, but he he's gigantic. He loves to run block. Uh, you know, I think he's going to be you know within the next couple of years one of the one of the better offensive linemen in the ACC. So if he can find some consistency in this one, uh, I think that's going to be really big and I think uh, you know the tight ends blocking a little bit is going to be important that's something that Will Mallory is inconsistent at uh, probably Miami's best blocking tight end is Dom Mamorelli uh, who's not much of a receiving threat but he's a good blocker so I think he's probably going to get some work in this one so uh, we shall see I think it's uh, very very important that they don't get whichever quarterback is back there uh, injured because you know that was Part of the reason why Tyler Van Dyke uh, got hurt against Duke was basically a, a free rusher just crushed him and, and dropped him on his shoulder in that one. So uh, so they certainly have to do better. And it's going to be one of the tougher matchups that they've had all season. I mean, I say what you want to about Texas A&M, but at the time Miami faced them, they had a very good uh, physical defensive line. Miami held up pretty well, but you know, a few injuries later, we'll see what they can do in this game. Now, we're going to get you, everybody, a prediction, I promise you. But before that, I predict that Drake has something to tell you that will make your life better. Actually, no, we don't have an ad for this break right now. So, actually, we're going over to the thing after a quick little stop. Alex, we are back. And now we need to get into what is it, what is going to happen in this game. We want to get a prediction from you, obviously. But I, I want to get into more of how exactly do you see this game playing out? I think earlier in the week I pointed out that Miami has had some struggles scoring in the first quarter and the first half overall of games. I'm not sure exactly what's the reason for that, but it doesn't feel like this is a matchup where Miami's well equipped to fall behind early and have to shoot their way back uh, into the game. So tell me how you expect to see this one go. 
Well, I mean, the first thing is, and and I think we all know this very well, having watched these games over the years, uh, this rivalry can be a bit unpredictable, right? I mean, you know, last year Miami goes into Tallahassee as sizable favorites, and they just were non-existent in the first half, and they they made it a game in the second half. Uh, so I, I kind of wonder if, if something crazy might happen in this one. I, I think you touched on something. That, there's no question Miami has to start fast. And a big part of that is going to be the energy at Hard Rock Stadium because it, it's it's sold out. It's going to be packed. We all know there's going to be a lot of Florida State fans there. I think Miami's going to very slightly outnumber the Florida State fans. So if Miami has a bad start and you know Florida State goes up two touchdowns early, the Miami portion of that crowd is going to get pretty quiet and pretty dejected. And then the opposite – can also happen if Miami gets a big start. Um, you know, I think little things are are gonna gonna be big in this one. Um, you know, one area, and I, I kind of laugh when I say this because again, it can't depend on this, but Miami has had a really solid kicking and punting game. So I think hidden yards are gonna be important. Uh, you know, Lou Headley, Lou Headley, the like 28-year-old Aussie punter. <laughs> I don't know how there? this he's still there. I don't know how this dude has eligibility. He's like a, an 11th year senior Headley, but he's he's still around. Uh, he's done an excellent job. You know, when you have an he offense that's older struggling. than me, man. <laughs> <laughs> and every inch of the dude is covered with tattoos. He's an amazing guy. Headley. I mean, there's there's nothing left to tattoo on that dude. He's really good. And uh, and Andy Borigalis, Miami's uh, sophomore kicker, uh, has been gaining confidence throughout the season. He was four for four last week against Virginia. So I, I think in, in a tough matchup like this, I think every yard of field position is going to count every, every point an extra point that your kicker can score is going to count. Um, so, you know, call me crazy. And I think I, I need to balance out some of the hate that you guys have been dropping throughout the week in the slander. But I, I, I think, uh, you know, in, in rivalries like this, sometimes the team you think is going to win easily. It ends up being a tougher night. I'm going to go from Miami to steal one, boys, at Hard Rock Stadium. It's going to be Doak South no longer, at least for this weekend. I'm going to go for a close 24-21 with Andy Borigalis challenging the spirit of his older brother, Jose Borigalis, a uh, Groza winner from a couple of years ago, and the Hurricanes getting a, a surprising, dramatic victory at Hard Rock Stadium, 24-21. Okay, I, Andres Borgales. you coming in here. Andres Borgales. Well, we, we yeah. call him Andy, all right? Yeah, I know, he goes, I know. He, he goes he's by Andres, Andres. Though. I'm Vance yeah. Wallen. My name is Andres. I just, I just want to put that. I just want to remind him, like, yo, hey, Jamo, it's okay. You can go by Andy, but whatever. <laughs> Dave? <laughs> yeah. Andres, uh, I respect that you came in here and said that. Uh, I, look, we've had we've been asking the question all week. Why does it have to be the case that in rivalry games it gets weird or it gets predictable or it gets close? I don't I don't like talking about this. Two years ago, it wasn't close. It was the opposite of close. Uh, it's it's yeah. it's possible to happen. Uh, I, I guess I'm wondering. I, I want your opinion on that too. Do you think that the nature of rivalry games changes the rules of things and makes things happen that shouldn't otherwise happen or that are inexplicable? <laughs> You know, I, I honestly think it does. And I think the biggest factor here, guys, is so many of these players know each other since they mm -hmm. were kids. Like how many of these guys played Pop Warner youth football with each other and against each other? There's going to be a lot of high school, former high school teammates on the field. So it's like, OK, even like, you know, some of the Miami guys may be thinking, OK, even if, you know, you guys may be having a, a better season than us right now. You know, I, I was just as good as you were when we squared up in high school and that mentality takes over. And I don't know if it's the superstition in me, but uh, I, I tend to be a lot more conservative when it comes to betting on rivalry games. Right. Because like I'm, I'm looking. Uh, yeah. So like I'm, I'm looking at uh, and I'm you know, I, I, the numbers moved around a lot between like nine and a half and seven and a half. Uh, I, I think it's around seven and a half, eight at this moment. It's, uh, yeah, it's seven and a half right now. Our friends are about a line. The pass has easily been all early sports action. Bingo. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I, I, I think if, if I if I were thinking of uh of betting on Florida State, I'd, I'd much rather do it now at seven and a half than, than I would have at nine and a half a few days ago. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. Like it, at nine and a half, I probably would have bet Miami to cover the nine and a half. So I, I think it's going to be a somewhat close game. But I'm, I'm going to sit this one out because I'm superstitious. Because well, whatever way I – maybe I should bet Florida State because usually whatever way I go, the opposite happens. No, no, I feel that. But actually, I like how you brought up that these kids, you know, grew up, grew up together playing opportunity. Pop Warner, Middle School, High School, Miami Central, Stranahan, all those schools down in the South Florida area. I asked this of Max. He's one of our, he's the oldest here, one of our best friends came on. 
is the dynamic a little bit different? And Dave, I don't know Dave's opinion on this. I'm kind of agreeing with Dave, but I want to ask you this too, that because a lot of the star players on both these teams are transfers, whether it be Jordan Travis, Johnny Wilson, Michael Pittman, aren't familiar with the white rivalry. Jordan Travis from West Palm Beach Air, so he kind of understands that, but Akeem Mesador is somewhere like that as well. Henry Parrish, I think he's from my, the South Florida area. He, is, too. Yeah, he's he, he does kind of get it. So does that change the kind of like outlook that they have for this game? If you are one of the kids that you know didn't grow up down here with that. Yeah, that could. Um, they're, they're definitely getting a crash course on it because, uh, you know, I, I think one, and I don't know if this is an advantage or what, but it's, a, it's certainly a factor. I mean, given Mario Cristobal being the head coach of Miami, a guy having played in the rivalry on the Miami side, uh, he's going to make sure that these guys understand, right? For the for the Akeem Mesidors and like the Colby Youngs of the world who didn't grow up like anywhere near South Florida or Tallahassee, uh, they've definitely been getting a crash course on that this week. So I, I kind of wonder if they're going to be like as indoctrinated as some of these other players by the time they take the field. Yeah, and I look, I want to get you out of here on a fun note. Uh, we'll, let, we'll get away from the game for a second. Is there anybody more than Florida State that you would just love Miami to beat? Or if the answer is Florida State, who other than Florida State would you just most want Miami to beat? Yeah, Florida State is not my most hated opponent. Uh, you, you guys are actually third on my list, believe it or Ooh, not. Okay. Number one is Notre Dame because I I, <laughs> I, I, I I go back. I'm old. I go back to the Catholics versus convicts days. Yeah. It's always like it was so sweet in 2017 when Miami just kicked their butts up and down Hard Rock Stadium. It was incredible. I think I enjoyed that m almost more than any. I mean, it wasn't as dramatic as some of the Florida State Miami games, right? Because it, you know, it was a blowout. It wasn't a wide right, wide left, that kind of thing. But that was an amazing moment. And also, um, I, I hate Florida a little bit more than Florida State. You know, it's it's that whole that whole thing about you know Miami accuses Florida of backing out of the rivalry in the '80s because they were cowards. Florida denies that. You know, the cowards. Gator, the Gator. Yeah, thank. I, I know you guys can agree with me on that. Yeah, the Gator flop Florida. thing from back in the day. So yeah, it's Notre Dame number one, Florida number two, and then Florida State is like right there, just behind Florida. I like to hear that. I like to hear that. See, so, yeah, I mean, we talked about it yesterday, like Dave. Like I think me and you are kind of in agreement that. I can't stand Florida. I look at Miami personally as like, you know, it's the cute little brother. I got a lot of friends and family that, you know, that went down, that went over there. The or, little brother thing. Here you go. Yeah, I know right there. Or, you know, they went to Palm Beach Community College, you know, got a degree there and got all their clothing from Walmart. But hey, you know, listen, that's what fan bases are for. And also Miami, I do got to ask you one question about probably the most famous person on Twitter for Miami. What is the deal with John Ruiz? <laughs> I have to yeah. ask him before you go because like, yeah. I, I, I just don't get it. I mean, I do, but I don't. I, I think he he is um, he he's such like a flamboyant personality that, uh, you know, I think he's come to realize for these for these businesses that he loves so much because he is the CEO of Life Wallet, Cigar, Boat Racing. I, I think he's found that if he's like on Twitter arguing with people all day and he makes his NILs very public, I mean, listen, NIL deals are happening all over the country, but you don't have too many Ruizes who are on Twitter talking about it constantly. I, I think he actually figured out, Hey, you know, I'm going to pay out these big NIL deals, which is you know great for Miami. But if I tweet about them constantly, it's also getting that word out about life wallet. Like, I signed up for Life Wallet a few months ago. I'm still not exactly sure what it does. It seems like a handy <laughs> tool, right? Like if ever, like if I'm incapacitated or something, my medical records are right there on Life Wallet. I, I signed up for Life Wallet because his advertising works, right? If he's so, if I, if I could afford one of his boats, I would buy one of his boats too. So he's he's just out there and he uh, he makes a meal. He loves the publicity. Hmm. Yeah, I would buy a boat if I could too. Uh, I, I also don't know what life wall it is, but Alex, I do know that we loved having you on today. We loved learning about Miami here. Please tell everybody where they can find you and where they can hear your sulky voice. Oh well, thank you so much for that. First of all, it's it's fun hanging with you guys. Even though I, I heard all the uh, all the bleeps and the expletives you've been dropping, how dare you talk about my? Oh, it's gonna be worse than the one we dropped tonight too. So yeah. just prepare for that. Yeah. It's gonna be great. But yeah, you guys can uh, can follow can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On Canes. Uh, yeah, most of my Canes propaganda I tweet from the Locked On Canes account. If you follow us there, we will follow you back. You can also follow my personal where I tweet some Canes and I tweet some. 
Italian soccer and I tweet some Miami Heat. I tweet about everything at Alex Dono. Dono spelled D-O-N-N-O. And guys, this was a lot of fun. And uh, we should do this again during basketball season as well. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I'm actually excited for that. Actually, Dave and I are big basketball fans. Coach Ham, Coach Larenega, that's a very fun rivalry. Now, Dave, let the folks know how much you love them, how much you hate Miami. And now give them the instructions for, you, for the YouTube and also for the podcast level. You probably don't need me to tell you how much I love you because you know it already, but I will say it anyways. I do love all of you for listening to us today and every day for the podcast. You know where you can find us anywhere you find your podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, Google Play. For the YouTube, please do like this video if you did like it, which you should. Also, subscribe to the channel. Ding the little bell at the top. It'll turn on your notifications, let you know when our episodes drop, and leave us some comments. Tell me, as usual, what I got wrong and what I did. And Miami fans, thank you for coming into our comments for the past few days. It's all in good fun, as always. But listen, thank you for listens. Because, you know, either you love to listen, you listen for love or you listen to hate. Either way, a listen is a listen, and we get paid for it. For Dave and Alex, this is Drake, and we'll see you all next time on Locked on Seminoles. Take care, everybody.